we're talking here today about Hollywood power shifts. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panel, and then we'll sort of come up with some initial remarks, and I think we'll have a very interesting conversation. We have a very distinguished and esteemed panel, so I, I think anything uh, they've forgotten more about Hollywood than most of us ever knew. So to begin with, we have Mohammed Al Mubarak, who was supposed to be immediately on my left, but is a little bit more towards the middle. Uh, he's the chairman of Imagination Abu Dhabi, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the new organisations now funding film uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, a whole range of movies have been funded by Imagination. Uh, my name is Khan, being one of the more commercially successful ones. Uh, also, Fair Game, obviously, which starred Naomi Watts. Uh, so, Imagination is becoming a key player and financier in the region. Uh, he's been the chairman of Imagination Abu Dhabi since January 2011, uh, and I think will tell us a lot more about one of the most important power shifts that we may or may, need, may, or may not be seeing going on. Is there a kind of move, if you like, from west to east? Uh, immediately on my left is Skip Pridnam. He's a senior partner and founder of uh, Azifrin Britain LLP. It's considered to be one of the top law firms uh, in, in Hollywood. Uh, I, 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 read on the, uh, I read from the Los LA Times that uh, Harrison Ford said that about Mr. Brittenham that he often represents everybody in the deal, which is, strikes me as a smart place for a lawyer to be. <laughs> and it seems that uh, I think he's even worked on some contracts for, for some of the members of the panel here. Uh, 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 and I also read, uh, I hope this is right, Skip, that in crucial moments in negotiations, you're not above going on a fishing holiday to kind of uh, 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 calm everybody down. Anyway, that's certainly what the LA Times says, so that seems like a nice, nice strategy. And Skip is the man who pioneered the back-end deal uh, uh, back in the day with, I think, Henry Winkler or the Fonz, which is the, probably the first, the original Hollywood power shift where money started to go from the studios to the talent in a way that hadn't been seen before. Next on the list, we have uh, Ari Emanuel. Uh, he, he's described kindly by the LA Times, as, uh, or, or the LA Times has asked whether he is the next Don Draper which uh, I don't know if that's good news for Don or for, for Ari. Uh, he's the co-CEO of uh, WME Entertainment. Uh, he was the founding partner of the legendary Endeavor talent agency and then pulled off the kind of merger and takeover of the, uh, uh, the long-established William Morris agency in 2009. Uh, some may have heard of his brother, uh, the mayor-elect to Chicago. Others, fans of Entourage, may have heard of Ari Gold, but what we have is the real thing, Ari Emanuel. So we'll see how we uh, we'll see how things go with him. But again, one of the key uh, Hollywood power shifts, I guess, we're uh, again we need to think about really is has, how far is power shifting away again from, if you like, the studios, from the studios to the talent, or indeed from the studios to the agents. Uh, further to my left, we have uh, Jim Giannopoulos, is the studio man on our panel here, the chairman and CEO of Fox Film Entertainment. Or, uh, He's, uh, uh, Fox has been long acclaimed as being one of the, the best run studios in Hollywood. It's clearly behind some of the massive franchise in Hollywood, not least, of course, Avatar, and we heard from Jim Cameron uh, earlier in this conference. Uh, his background was perhaps in international distribution. Uh, that was where uh, you know, he learned very early on the importance of the global, the international box office, that the future of Hollywood lay not just in the US, but also in the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he was once uh, acclaimed again uh, by Jim Cameron as, uh, as being, well, the real boss, if you like. There's a poster on the wall, I think, in your office. It was only one time a Titanic poster. Jim G, you rule the world, from Jim C. So we'll see if he can continue to rule the world or whether the power is shifting away from the studios to some of the other guys on the panel here. And then lastly, but by no means least, we have Water Parks from Parks McDonald Productions. Water Parks represents, if you like, the production uh, the, the, the production brains, the creative brains behind a movie project. Uh, he's been a producer and screenwriter, former head of motion pictures at DreamWorks Studios from its inception. Uh, he's now, uh, you know, works on a whole range of his own projects. Uh, right now, I think the range is as varied as Men in Black 3. Uh, so all sorts of excitement about big stars and big guns. Uh, but he's also remaking, uh, you know, a movie classic, The Fallen Idol, originally came out in 1948, originally set in Britain. Now, uh, with the help of a partnership with uh, money from Imagination Abu Dhabi, it's going to be set in India. It's going to be a completely different kind of independently financed movie. So he works on the complete range of Hollywood movies, and he's well-placed, I think, to answer the questions about, you know, his power, you know, in the light of the success of the King's Speech, his power shifting, if you like, from the big studios to the smaller independents or independently financed movies. So we have plenty to think about and plenty to talk about when it comes to Hollywood power shifts. 
uh, and a whole range of topics to discuss. So I've touched on a few already, but I think there's a whole range of themes that we can think about, and we'll work through some of them in this discussion, and maybe some of you will have questions about them. There are questions really about whether we've got consumers turning into pirates, questions about how the market is evolving, if you like, from DVD to download or to streaming. I've touched on already, is, you know, is, is the balance of power in filmmaking and film finance moving from west to east in a meaningful way? Are we seeing power shifting from studios to independently financed movies? What about the relationship between story and technology? Is technology beginning to take over the story? We had some of that discussion last night with James Cameron. And maybe there's a kind of move from, I don't know, from talent or an excess to a kind of new morality, which is my way of mentioning Charlie Sheen. And so maybe that's something we need to think about as well, that, that, that we've got a, we're in a different kind of world, uh, that stars and talent have to behave in a different way, and perhaps even they're losing some power. So plenty to think about, plenty to talk about. We had a very live discussion behind the scenes just before we arrived about piracy. That feels like the first place to start. So I want to get things going and talk about, if you like, the movement from consumers. You know, are we moving in a world from consumers to pirates? Jim, you run a studio. You run a studio. Tell me a bit about how you feel. How worried are you about the prospect of piracy eroding into? I don't know what happens with the next Avatar movie whenever that arrives. Well, the greatest power shift. We started talking about power shifts. The greatest power shift in the media and entertainment industry is to the consumer. The consumer controls their choice, they control access, they control what they want to watch, how they want to watch, what medium they want to watch it in. And our job is to make available the best possible content in as many places as possible and to get paid for it. So um, we'd like to think that the abundance of choices and um, access that consumers have and their choice of, of, of business models. You know, you can, you can watch a movie for $5, you can go to an IMAX theater and pay $25. That's part of the consumer's range of choices. Um, competing with free, competing with stolen content is, uh, is a very difficult business model. So obviously a lot of what we do around the world is try and provide consumers with as many legitimate choices of great content as possible and diminish their access to illegal sources of content. Uh, Mohammed, give, give us a view from the UAE. How do you contend with the kind of piracy issue here? Uh, I think, uh, following what my colleague said, content is the most important thing. And I truly believe if it's the right content, then piracy loses. And what we've tried to do here in the Middle East is, of course, with the laws that we've put in, uh, is you know the access of downloading sites, the access of uh, and the Pirates DVDs, we've tried to control it as much as we can. But, right, but again, it also goes back to content, in my opinion. If the content is the right content, then you just beat any downloading site. And you just rather pay the $25 or the $5 and go to the movie theater. Uh, uh, I mean, one, one isn't of that a bit simplistic? Don't we need some more stronger political? Well, one dynamic? of the things we were talking about backstage was, um, and you know, a bunch of us have been on this issue. Um, France has implemented the three-strike rule as you were saying, England's in the middle of, um, of uh, uh, the political uh, winds of that issue. Um, hopefully, uh, in New York, we can get um, uh, this implementation in some sort of three-strike uh, rule in place. I think uh, the White House in Washington probably is looking to that in some capacity, um, but it's a major issue um, when um, we all know that the ISPs could actually control this, and they are electing, um, and from our perspective as kind of uh, the people that create content, not to do it. Um, and uh, I think it actually is one of the big issues confronting us. The other issue is, listen, from where I sit, and I think maybe where Skip sit as representatives of, of, um, of talent, c compared to where Jim sits, um, you know, the, the mass, the, uh, the expansion of distribution is a good thing, um, subject to actually being, being able to control um, the um, illegal downloads. Because there's just more places for us to create content and to kind of extract kind of some value for our clients. So that's a good thing in, in this conversation, if we can get past the front end of this conversation of, of illegal downloads. Uh, Skip, you're... Yeah, well, I think, I think actually the more interesting question is how the net and how social interaction is impacting how people choose movies. And I think there was a theory that about five years ago that what was gonna happen with all of the various choices across all the media is the consumers will be much more selective 
and therefore the bottom would get wider and deeper, the top would come down and the middle would come down. And I think actually that theory is totally wrong. I think that what's really happened is that consumers are less discriminating. And what they do is they rely on a core group of consumers that drive them you know, through Facebook, through other things, and therefore, in most media, the top can be higher than ever before. So if you love a movie, like Avatar, it can go further than before, or like Alice. On the other hand, if you just like a movie, it'll come way down, and if you're indifferent, it'll be crushed. So I think, I think one of the biggest changes has been that social, uh, social media is actually driving the way consumers uh, 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 yeah. buy movies and yeah. go to movies. But I think it's had a big impact on the studios because the studios are nervous about that because basically what's happened is everything's a meritocracy. If the kids like it, they all go see it. If they don't, they don't. You can't fool them with marketing. So what they're doing is they're defaulting to known properties. This year, there'll be 27 sequels, prequels, spinoffs uh, out of a little over 100 movies, mm. over a fifth of the movies. You know, it'll be the eighth Harry Potter, the seventh Planet of the Apes, the, the fourth parts of the uh, Caribbean, the fourth uh, uh, Twilight. Uh, so the, the studios are going where they feel safe. Mm. Uh, now, I, bl what, I blame what, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Blame yeah. Jim. Uh, with the exception of Jim, of course. But what, what's, what's also happening is because they're going where they're safe mm. uh, and there are only so many safe properties, they're starting to wander into areas okay. you know, where they're really not safe. Okay. So, so, Jim, you're a studio boss. How do, you, how, how do you see, is there a power shift from west to east? How do you see your decision making being affected by that dynamic? Well, it's, it's interesting. That, you mentioned you know, earlier, My Name is Calm, which is a co-production we did with Image Nation. And that was a film which originated in India, in Bollywood, but it was a film where um, some of the best filmmakers of the country wanted to reach out and tell a story which, which um, transcended its own borders. And so the film was primarily set in the US, roots in, in Bollywood, but thematically was accessible all over the world. And in fact, we released it in many places throughout the world, all over Europe, and it was a huge success here in the UAE, and the biggest Indian Bollywood movie export in, in Bollywood history. The reason being that it was a great story, well told, with thematic values that were universal. And will you put more of your capital at work into movies like that? Well, we have been. We've created a division, uh, Fox International Productions, which is the, the division that, that produced that film. Um, and we were very fortunate in the middle of the, as much as we were very proud of Avatar, on a single weekend at the beginning of the year, we had the biggest um, the most successful uh, film, the number one film in China, the number one film in India. And they, neither of them were our films. They were local films, Chinese mm -hmm. film and an Indian film, and, and, showing and the potential of those markets if you get the story right. Okay, w Walter, you were signaling, I'm eager to bring you in. How do you see it from a creative perspective? Again, do you see a different kind of, de as a producer, do you see a different kind of dynamic emerging you're obviously making? In terms of East-West? Yes, you're, well, you know, you're yeah, working with uh, imagination. How's that Listen, I, I don't think that we look at these emerging markets as something to go create product for specifically. Rather, I think we realize there's great vibrancy potential in those markets in terms of going from west to east. So therefore, it, in one, the way I tend to look at it is that one's instinct looks at a piece of material, a script, an idea. Once it gets to a script time, you assess its potential out there financially, and then you reverse engineer what you can afford to spend on it responsibly. And one of the ways you do that is to look at does it have a potential life around the globe? Is there ways to help its life around the globe to, uh, through strategic partnerships or casting? What I think is most interesting, though, is that there have been just, I think in the last 10 years, two great examples of big breakout movies which have their, uh, their, their roots in uh, uh, regions outside of the US. Uh, Flying Tiger, Hidden Dragon being one, which was very much a Hong Kong movie, and of course, Slumdog Millionaire, which like embraced and embodied you know, certain aspects of the Bollywood movie. They transcended and yet also uh, uh, you know, embraced local culture, and I think that that is the key to find, I mean, these smaller movies we're talking about are fantastic and it keeps the pipes open and terrific. When you find those things which simultaneously embrace and reflect and transcend specific local film narrative culture, then you really have the beginning of a global cinema. 
And I just I, I want to share an observation that was made to me by a guy named Guillermo Arriaga, a wonderful Mexican screenwriter who wrote all of the Inaratu movies, things like, uh, you know, 21 we, Grams. Yeah, Twilight. exactly. And he, 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 his movies tend to be partially in English and partially in Spanish. And he said that there was, they did market research and they didn't have any problem in the US with people looking at subtitles, as we know has always been a problem. Guillermo asked me, why do you think that is? I said, well, I, I don't know. And I said, it's because we have a generation now who's used to texting. Mm -hmm. oh. So you suddenly have a young generation who are used to seeing their primary communication source in written language. And it was his feeling that that will break a barrier that we've dealt mm -hmm. with for years that somehow American audiences are adverse to subtitles. Okay, that's But they're not as true, it's interesting. I'm like, just going back to Skip's comment on cinemas mm -hmm. and the increase in cinemas in China and, uh, and all over Asia. I think we were talking in the back on the importance of cinema here in, in Abu Dhabi or in the UAE. Uh, and I was, and I, there's a statistic I gave this, our colleagues here that I'm sure surprised them. Today in Abu Dhabi, we did a survey and the average local family goes to the cinema three times a week. That is unheard of anywhere. Mm. Because, like again, this is a storytelling culture. People like to hear stories, whether they're in English, or in Indian, or in Japanese, or in Chinese, they like to hear stories. So if you can make movies with the right content for this part of the world, this is just a, it's a, it's a cash cow, really. Okay, I, I wanna see, are there, we, got, we got time for maybe two or three questions from the floor, or remarks. Uh, I don't know if anyone's sort of got a burning question to put to the panel. You seem very well behaved. I've got a gentleman. I've got a gentleman here, and then I've got a lady at the front. Um, can you comment on uh, some of the emerging trends in transmedia production? In other words, where the uh, where the creative property is being prepped for multi-platform distribution from day one. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is, if we hold that question in mind, can we take the question from the? So there's a woman in the front and the middle here. Um. I, all the comments about how important content is is true. I want to ask a more specific and slightly more political question because I think in light of the recent revolution in Egypt, the content of films has a potentially greater importance in the political sphere because the, all of the problems in Egypt were present in their most uh, expensive and most important film, the Yacoubian building, yet that film wasn't really even seen in the United States and wasn't clearly known particularly to people in the US government. And similarly, there are still the relatively negative stereotypes of Muslims in films coming out of America. It's gotten better, but it still happens. And you have the rise of Islamophobia in America. I know that movies are movies and you're not the State Department, you can't take on these agendas, but I'm wondering what is your thought in a positive way of if indeed this does become more global, what is the way to get people to understand what is really going on? Because all this talk about the people's voice, okay. the people's voice, how much attention are governments paying to this people's okay. voice? Thanks very, thanks very much. Uh, Mohammed. maybe on that second, what do you think about that second question, the content of movies and the portrayal, if you like, of well, it's a very valid Muslim question. culture? And, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's, Today, Muslim culture is portrayed in many ways in uh, Western movies. I think the, uh, the, in British movies, it's uh, closer to heart because I think there is a stronger interaction with the Muslim culture in the UK. Uh, they take a more of a comedic side of, uh, of uh, I mean, there was just a recent movie that was, uh, that was about three suicide bombers, but it was a comedy. And, uh, you know, and it just gives you a different view of the matter. Now, what's going on in the United States, I think that shift is starting to happen. I think there's recent movies that are showcasing a lot of Arabs and Muslims in the U.S. government, in, uh, in civil services uh, that are changing. Um, now, the other point you discussed about Egypt and about the, the movies that are coming out of this part of the world, I think this is going to be a major platform to the West to showcase uh, the, whether there's injustice in this part of the world or whether there's the need uh, a focus in this part of the world, and uh, I think the movie you described about the, uh, the the building movie. I think that played a huge role here in the Middle East because a lot of us didn't know what was going on in Egypt. And when we watched this movie, you know, the, you know, it started a massive buzz in the in other platforms, i.e., Facebook, and uh, and I think more of that you're going to see coming out of this part of the world. But I think if you guys can stress on uh, 
what is most Muslim culture and Arab culture and how is it being portrayed in movies today? I'm sure you have more insight than I do. Well, I think it's actually a, a, an excellent point to say that access to information, to news, to what's really happening, and social media are a break on stereotypes in any form of, of entertainment and filmmaking. And um, hopefully as that, as that access continues, uh, stereotypes um, are reduced and people get to see and hear and understand what's really happening and you know, understand what people around the world are really like. Well, I just want to take the opportunity to say our question was just, I, I want to introduce the questioner, if I can. This is Cynthia Snyder, who is a, a professor of political science at Georgetown and is a, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. She's also behind something called MOST, which is uh, m m museums and uh, uh, Muslims on screen and television. Mm. Uh, and Cynthia is also the former ambassador in the Clinton administration uh, to the Netherlands. And she's been a tireless advocate on behalf of the normalization of the Islamic and, and Western world, U.S. Islamic relationships through cultural diplomacy. Uh, quite uh, ironically, I'm sitting here right now because I worked with, with Cynthia on a number of Brookings Institute uh, uh, meetings in Doha about this very thing that stemmed from my, uh, I was one of the producers of The Kite Runner, which was perceived as one of the times where there was a wide range of, of Islamic characters uh, portrayed. So, my point to you, though, Cynthia, and the people in the room, she's a, a very, very important resource for this particular cultural diplomatic issue. You know, uh, it's a little like the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And I think that we may not have a responsibility as uh, content creators of going and, and positively changing the world or whatever, but we certainly have a responsibility to not make things worse. And it's just bad storytelling to use stereotypes and it's something that I believe, as this Jim, through social networking and all of, a lot of other things will disappear eventually. Okay. Um, I think also uh, it has to start with the youth. I think if, it's, if you start seeing more animation, um, you know, I, I guarantee if tomorrow there's a Disney movie uh, that's, that discusses Muslim morals and has an Arab character in a hero role, you know, that is a start. That will probably change a lot of views in the youth. And I think that, that mm -hmm. could be a massive domino and many dominoes to come sure. ahead. Now, I don't know how good your memory is, but I wanted to go back to the first question and talk about the kind of changing dynamic. I know, are you well placed to kind of answer? I mean, I think probably that's, produced. that's probably more um, uh, poignant to the television business where people are, um, you know, 60% of viewing right now is with a, uh, when you're watching a TV show is with an iPad or, or a secondary use. So the the commencement of interactivity and kind of socialization is happening more um, on the television side than it is on the movie side. And as those platforms start to get built out, um, you will see um, people kind of building for multiple platforms. In addition, you know, there's a big question whether social gaming is gonna go to um, uh, add to the conversation as it relates to taking content that is existed and then moving it into the social gaming front. Um, again, um, I believe that is probably gonna start in the television area and move um, into multiple platforms. I don't believe it's as much in the movie business. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, right now we're only talking about content as it relates to as we all know it, meaning movies and television. Um, if you talk to my, one of my kids and, and, you know, I say this to people, you know, the definition of content, we all have to change that definition because I won't want to tell you what he watches on YouTube and I wouldn't define it as content, but he would define it as content, right? So, um, you know, there's multiple forms of content right now, but probably to answer your question, probably that's going to come from television more. But I think, I think big movies are brands, brands in the making. Everybody wants them to turn them into brands, so you want to be able to move them into all of the media. Uh, what's happening today is they're spending more advertising now in the net than they used to, about 10% on average, but there have been some movies, like for instance, the Justin Bieber movie or Paranormal, they spent 30 to 50% of, of the, of the uh, ad budget on, on the net. They were very, very successful. But the reason you want to make something into a brand is because then you can access ancillary revenues. Like I started with Pixar when they were a commercials company, and some of their movies, like for instance, uh, 
Cars, which wasn't one of their more successful movies, uh, they have retail sales of these little cars are about uh, $8 billion. Um, toy, uh, toy Story has over $10 billion. Uh, they try to move that. It's in the game, game area, mobile game area. So you try to move into all the various parts of the media because it enhances the brand <coughs> and the long-term value of the franchise because then you want to do another one. We're doing that with Hasbro. So you know, we started the channel with Hasbro. We're then doing social games with them. We're doing things on the net with a bunch of their property. Going to what Skip originally started with, you know, f having to find brands just based on where the marketplace is. You know, we're taking a bunch of their um, uh, product and their IP and their toys and moving them into now um, theatrical distribution. So, you know, that's the way you know we're trying to capture that as as Skip has pointed out in other things. Jim, what's your take on it as a studio well, boss? First of all, uh, you know, technology affords us the ability to access people as never before, and um, our films find their way into every form of viewing and display possible. And this year, um, one estimate is that they'll sell 475 million smartphones and tablets worldwide, somewhere between 60 and 80 million tablets alone. Um, do we make movies intended to be seen on a, t on a phone? No. Do people enjoy watching it that way? Absolutely. Um, as far as technology is concerned, we're agnostic. As I said earlier, as long as we're reasonably compensated for it and people can enjoy the experience. And, you know, I've always said we'd deliver a movie on a piece of toast if someone could watch it. We don't really <laughs> care. Um, and at the same time, the, the, um, the applications that form and derivative works, and we're just finishing a film about to release, and Carlos Saldana, the director, is going to be here with Jim Cameron on Thursday to talk about making this film Rio, which is the um, same director did Ice Age uh, 2 and 3. We also made, uh, entered into a relationship with the people who created Angry Birds, and so there'll be a Rio version, because the character in the movie is a bird, and their estimate is they'll sell 100 million downloads in the next you know, 45 days after the app launches. I hope they're right, I'm knocking wood, but it's an example of the movie will be seen on every kind of device possible, and the app hopefully will be successful as a game and in other forms as well, so. What, you what, Walter, do you despair uh, movies based on computer games? I thought they were all would I despair? Yeah, movies based on computer games. I, I, thought they were I, kind of I, I wouldn't despair if, if, I, if, if, I, if I owned Angry Birds, I wouldn't despair. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but but, 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 uh, but no, artistically... They're, it's, it, they're very, very challenging, you know, to, as, as movies from comic books are because the, uh, you know, the source material doesn't necessarily in itself, but that doesn't mean very good storytellers can't figure out a way to create, uh, create narrative from that. You know, uh, it gets back to me this question of, uh, of unpredictability. I, I used to be involved in the running of the studio, and it was part of my job is to understand how these markets are emerging, how we're we going to react to them. And we are a very reactive business. I mean, Hollywood's a very strange business in that way. We, we don't do an R and D, and we have to quickly see what's going out there. But uh, I'm kind of at a point now where I, I kind of say that's out there, but the core value where value is created is in the creation of the intellectual property. And that the intellectual property will find its way to all of these platforms if it's a valuable property. And, and just in terms of how I do my business, I try to keep my focus pretty much just on that. All right, well, it's gone flashing red on the monitors below us, so I feel like the power has shifted from us on the stage here to whoever's <laughs> controlling the kind of a uh, the, time, the time and the rest in the conference. So listen, thank you very much to members you. of our panel. I feel thank like we've you. only just got going on this discussion, but uh, thank you for your time and thoughts, and I hope that was stimulating for everyone in the audience. Thanks very much. Thank you.